Okay, we should get going, I guess. Uh, welcome, everyone. I hope everyone's having a great time at NetDevConf. Uh, it seems that we have a lot of productive uh, conversations so far. Uh, everything's going well. So my talk today is about checksumming. You would think that we figured out checksumming after how many decades we've had the internet so far, but uh, obviously this talk is necessary, so we haven't. Uh, so what we're going to talk about is the, a message from our friend Mies van der Rohe here on the screen. Uh, he's saying less is more. And if you want to know how committed he was um, to this message, he also says, if I could do less, I would do that more often. <laughs> so the point we're trying to make is uh, sophisticated facilities are not necessarily better, and we're going to go through why that's the case. So first, we're going to go through the history of, we're going to talk about how the internet checksumming works. We're going to go through the history of how hardware has been implemented over time, the features that have shown up, and whether they're good or bad, or how they help us or don't help us. Then we're going to talk about how tunneling and encapsulation interacts with all of these issues, and then uh, we're going to make an argument for having ubiquitous one complement checksum facilities and hardware, and why that's what we want from, uh, from the NICs out there. So the basics are the internet checksum is a ones complement checksum computed over the packet contents. Um, it's done with the header field, the header checksum field set to zero. It also incorporates the pseudo header values into the uh, checksum computation as well for UDP, TCP, and others. And then the, once the checksum is computed, it's negated and put into the checksum field. What does this mean uh, when it's validated? It means that we do the reverse process and it's just, the result should evaluate to zero if the checksum is correct. That is important for an interesting discovery we've made recently for encapsulation situations, which I'll describe earlier. But just remember that when we have a, 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 a UDP packet, for example, the UDP header out to the end of the data and, and we validate the checksum on receive, the result is zero. That's important because uh, it has implications for encapsulation. So you can compute the internet checksum, the ones complement checksum with a whole bunch of tricks. Uh, CPUs have add with carry instructions, so this handles the case of the uh, overflow bits propagating out to the end of the value that you're using. In the simplest terms, you could do 16 bits at a time additions with carries, but that's not efficient. We have 32-bit and 64-bit CPUs, so what is legal is you can compute 32-bit at a time additions with carry instructions and then collapse that folded at the end. So uh, those are the two tricks that people use on CPUs and uh, ASICs to uh, compute it more efficiently. Um, now let's go into the kinds of hardware we've had over time. Back in the day, originally, when I started working on this kind of stuff, there was no hardware checksum facilities in the car. And actually, it, it wasn't very useful at the time, to be quite honest with you. Um, in fact, you were lucky if you had even a ring buffer on these cards. Uh, a lot of these cards were simple FIFOs. You put a packet into the FIFO and you said go, and that was the amount of, you could only queue one packet at a time. They were very simplistic devices. But then we started to get devices like the uh, Deck Lance, and the Deck Lance was one of the first chips to have a DMA ring buffer, which we actually consider the fundamental data structure for fast networking these days. Uh, it's an interesting story. The initial drivers for the Deck Lance chip didn't even take advantage of the ring buffer, they just still queued one packet at a time to the DMA descriptor and then waited for it to com for the completion and would only submit another packet once the first one was sent. That's not very uh, useful. So Van Jacobson uh, extended the driver to uh, actually take advantage of the ring buffer and do back-to-back -back packet transmissions. But then the problem he ran into was when he actually plugged this this system into the network that was doing these back-to-back -back transfers, it basically crashed every other receiving system out there at the time. So he had a lot of bugs to fix uh, before he could turn on all the features in the Lance driver. Another thing that drove uh, perhaps the, the lack of checksum offloading facilities back then was checksumming we could do basically for free uh, from various uh, perspectives. We didn't have things like splice, like send file, all these zero copy uh, interfaces. So what was happening was the user had to do a send message call or a receive message call. And at that point, we had to copy the data into the networking buffers in the kernel. So there's a copy implicit in all of the IO operations users would do on a socket. As a result, we could, it turns out that the memory dominates the cost. We all know that. And 
we could, in parallel, compute the checksum as we were doing the copy. The computation of the checksum ended up being for free. Uh, so this is very easy for send. You do the send message, you have to copy the data, you do the checksum at that time, and you put it into the packet. On receive, it's a little bit more complicated. Uh, what you need to have happen is that you need to do that copy into user space of the socket data in the context of the receive message call. And the only situation, the situation where that works is if the user has blocked in the receive message, but that's not how people do apps. They pull, they wait for data to arrive, and then they call receive message. So uh, there's limited use cases for being able to do checksum plus copy on re in receive, but it did happen. Um, so that was, that's how things were a long time ago. So let's talk about how things became. It seemed like the first generation of these devices we got that would do checksumming were, how serious say it, stateful. Uh, they knew how to park, pass packet, header, packet headers, and they would just give us this Boolean state that said, the checksum's okay, or I don't know, or it's potentially bad, you should, you should verify it yourself. So this helps, this gives checksum offloading facilities, and around the same time period is when we started having send page, send file, splice, and all those other interfaces where we could take advantage of checksumming on transmit to a, to a significant extent. The problem, like I said, is that it's stateful, it knows how to pa parse packet headers, therefore if it encounters a header type it doesn't understand, you're screwed. So if you want to use a new protocol, if you want to use SCTP, or you want to use an encapsulating uh, uh, tunneling technology that the hardware doesn't support, you don't get checksumming offload, so you either have to not use that technology or you have to hope that your hardware vendor will add support for it, which is a big if, and then you would have to buy new hardware and propagate it throughout your infrastructure to take advantage of it. This is not extensible, this doesn't really work very well, it's, it's, it's not user friendly, it, it really doesn't help us in the long term, and it, it's kinda, it could kind of kill the internet in a, in a way, which I'll get into later. Um, but uh, at least in a, a few limited cases, there were some other devices that had a different approach, and this approach was, that the chip said, okay, when you receive a packet from me in the descriptor, I'm gonna give you the, two, the ones complement sum computed over the entire packet. And this is really useful because the stack can just adjust the headers out of that computed uh, checksum calculation to get the actual checksums that it wants for UDP, IP, TCP, and, uh, and regardless of what tunneling encapsulation and layers you have in between, checksum validation still works all the way up the stack on receive. On transmit, there's a slightly different facility given. Uh, on transmit, we tell the chip, okay, start computing from this part of the packet till the end, and whatever you compute as your 16-bit ones complement, stick it into this location here, which is a separate offset. Um, in order to make this work, the stack has to precede the checksum field in the header. Like I said earlier, the pseudo header is, is, is computed into the checksum for UDP, TCP, et cetera. So we put that into the checksum field, and the way that it works out is that the, if the chip just linearly computes the ones complement checksum, it'll compute the right value and put it in the right, right location. This is the kind of model we want to see hardware doing. This is what works. Um, there are NICs that do this already. Uh, Sun, believe it or not, was making Ethernet chips that provided this kind of checksumming offload a decade or so ago. So uh, it's not like it, it can't be done, it's not like no one thought of it before, it's just that it's not ubiquitous and it's not in the places we need it to be. Um, so let's get into tunneling. So you have, uh, so a large majority of uh, tunneling t technologies are over UDP, and there's a reason for that, which I'll get into later. Uh, but what's important to know is that we now run into situations where every trans a transmitted packet has multiple checksums to compute. So for existing cards, what do we do? Which one do we offload? Uh, and more specifically, which part of the packet is that see some start and see some offset thing on transmit going to refer to? Well, the funny thing is that we actually support for multiple checksum offloads is completely unnecessary. The only, only the fundamental do one checksum at a time facility is what we need. And it's really interesting why that is. So Edward Cree at Solar Flare came up with this uh, facility called uh, lo Local Checksum Offload. And it doesn't matter if you guys don't like it because I applied his patches right before this talk, so it's in the tree already. This is, that's history, that's been done already. It can't be changed. 
But anyways, this important observation is that the outer checksum, so if you're tunneling using a UDP-based tunneling protocol, that checksum is it, it, it's, it's trivially computable at transmit time in software because it doesn't depend upon the rest of the packet. Why? The reason I explained earlier, the inner checksum of the uh, uh, transport frame inside the tunnel evaluates the zero if you compute the ones checksum over it minus the pseudo header. So if you just take the pseudo header and all the intermediate headers up until the tunnel, you can know statically at transmit time what the inner outer checksum is going to be. So you just put it in there and you're done. We just need the, the card to do the outer checksum because we know what the rest is going to be. It's because the checksum field is in there is why it evaluates like this. So one concern might be, uh, well, that's okay if we controlled the whole packet and we generated uh, as an end host, right? Uh, the issue here is the ones complement internet checksum is weak. That's, everyone knows that. So we don't want to do things that potentially would make the checksum weaker. Uh, so one concern might be, well, if we're forwarding and in, encapsulating into a tunnel, we didn't compute the inner checksum, so we shouldn't do this magic thing on the outer, outer uh, checksum that is going to not propagate the error if the inner checksum was miscalculated, for example. But that's not an issue. Actually, when you're forwarding traffic and encapsulating into a, a UDP-based tunnel on transmit, we would tell the card to compute the checksum on the outer header, just compute the whole thing. So uh, if any in errors introduced on the outer checksum would be our mistake, and we would preserve any errors or non-errors in the checksum of the inner packet computed by someone else. So we retain all the end-to-end -end principles of checksum calculations and it wouldn't be an issue. There is a side note discussion uh, about a facility created by uh, Tom Herbert called Remote Checksum Offload. And there's an extension to tunneling technologies to try to handle the case of uh, handling the inner versus the outer checksum. So basically, it's a piece of metadata that tells the receiver how to handle the inner checksum. And on transmit, we set up the, 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 uh, the piece of metadata, and we only compute the outer checksum. And then the receiver uses the, it validates the outer checksum and then uses the cookie in the metadata to, figure out, to, ha to handle the inner checksum properly. Now, for the most part, this actually isn't needed because as I just described to you, local checksum offload works very well but we still need something like remote checksum offload for a few edge cases. For example, if the car doesn't do any checksum offloading at all, receive checksum offload can help us quite a bit. Another situation is that some cards have restrictions, like if there are multiple checksums in the packet in inner and outer header, in certain situations they may not be able to do the inner header, they may be only able to checksum the outer header, and we know of several cards that are in this category. So. Uh, it's not needed universally, but uh, it's useful in some limited cases. So remote checksum offload uh, is still something uh, that's useful. Protocol ossification. The point of oss uh, uh, ossification is that two stateful, two finely focused optimizations and offloads in hardware have effectively started to make parts of the internet cast in stone. If you don't, if, if it, it's not going over UDP or it's not going over TCP, you don't get any of the offloads, you don't get any checksumming, you don't get segmentation offloads, you don't get any of this stuff. So that's why there's this proliferation of X over UDP protocols because it's a transport that allows us to get checksumming and segmentation offloads. Um, and this is one of the pain points of uh, sophisticated hardware offloads. We, they actually end up hurting us, not helping us. Uh, it's to the point where someone tried to even do tunneling over TCP. That is to send unrestricted rate packets over a TCP with TCP headers encapsulating tun uh, a tunnel, which is just ridiculous. It would actually absolutely completely break the internet because the internet, every node on the internet that passes packets around assumes that t there's a TCP congestion control algorithm sitting behind that flow and that the flow can be influenced by dropping packets and, and uh, delays and whatnot. It's not true if you just have a, uh, a burst of uh, uncontrolled frames going over uh, TCP headers. That's, it's not legal. You can't do it. So what's the final argument? What, what are the arguments for people to have one's complement uh, checksums everywhere? 
your chipset logic would be less complicated. I know you guys have VXLAN offloads, other kind of tunneling offloads, you've got in, these InfiniBand things, you've got RDMA, you've got all this complicated stuff in there, and you have support for parsing all kinds of different protocols, but you only, if you do things the way we're suggesting, you only need one piece of logic to compute checksums and to, uh, uh, in, in packets. Uh, it's one piece of logic you'll have to test, and it's one piece of logic that you'll have to deal with bugs in. And in addition to that, the feature sets and the performance characteristics you'll provide to your customers will be more consistent. Regardless of the customer uses uh, UDP tunneling technology, GRE, VXLAN, whatever, they'll get the same level of performance as, uh, with respect to offloading and checksumming. Uh, the kernel itself would become uh, simpler. Because we have such a varied uh, mechanisms for, uh, that hardware has for supporting checksumming offload, we have a lot of different cases to deal with in the networking stack. It would be great if we could just consolidate this all into the ones, ones complement uh, ubiquitous situation. Um, there's less ossification, because now if we have this one's complement checksum and the receive descriptor, it doesn't matter what kind of stuff is inside the packet. We can always validate one's complement checksums no matter where they are in the layering. Um, and another thing that I think gets lost in the discussions around this is you have to understand that just because you make some new part that supports the new protocol and can check some offload for it, it doesn't matter for people running big data centers because it's, the low, it's, it's whatever feature set the least capable card is in the stack in their, in their collection of machines, that's what they can support and that's what they can make use of. That's the thing that they're gonna be able to uh, deploy. Uh, it's, it's just really painful to, to update stuff and have uh, discontinu discontinuous sets of features amongst different hardware. So the message to the hardware designers is simple. We want raw ones complement offloads. That's what we want. On the receive descriptor, we want a runs complement over the entire packet. And on transmit, we want a facility that allows us to say to the card, start from here, compute the ones check, complement, check, complement checksum, and stick it into this 16-bit location at, at offset X within the card. That's all we want. It allows every single facility to be handled properly and allows us to offload checksums in any possible situation. It's universal, and it's, it's really what we should be striving for. Um, so in, in conclusion, the kernel's, kernel needs only something very simple. It just wants the 16-bit value over the whole packet. If going past that has almost no value at all, it actually gets in our way. It's, it's not what we want. Uh, so, like I said, we can support anything if we have ubiquitous ones complement checks somewhere else. So I think that's the direction hardware should be going. Um, don't listen to me at your own peril. <laughs> so, Mies is asking us, what part of less is more didn't you understand? <laughs> one second. I'm about to compliment your company. You probably don't want to interrupt me right now. <laughs> so, back in uh, February, I gave a talk in Ottawa about uh, many things, but I tried to focus on switch steps since that was the topic du jour at the time. And I ended one of my slides with, in advance, I'd like to thank the first hardware vendor to merge hardware switching driver upstream. Uh, you will be the trailblazer. And thanks to Mellanox, <laughs> thanks to Mellanox, we have an upstream switch driver right now, so thank you, Mellanox. One more round of applause for Mellanox. They did a great job. But the problem is, problem is, that's not enough. Um, <laughs> it's great that we have uh, one driver upstream and we're having all the APIs worked out, but if Mellanox is the only one who does an upstream driver, that's, that's of zero value to a lot of people. So if you have someone who does switch, dri switch, piece, switch hardware, strongly encourage them to also have a switch dev driver so we can have a really healthy ecosystem of devices and also realize that if if and when all your competitors move to switch dev and you weren't in the initial discussions to design things you may be really behind the ball if something that's important to you isn't incorporated into the apis we are designing right now so it is to your advantage to be in here at this early period where we have a lot of flexibility to change things and to design things properly and to have a really strong foundation for all switch dev drivers in the future. So I just wanted to make a mention of that. Uh, finally, I'd like to thank people. I'd like to thank Pablo, Jamal, the whole NetDev Conf team, all the people who worked really hard to make this uh, conference run as smoothly and as uh, uh, fantastically as it has so far. So here's one for the NetDev Conf team. You guys did a great job.
I'd like to specifically thank Tom Herbert for beating on this topic a, for a long time now. I didn't think it, something so fundamental would be such a huge issue, but Tom saw this coming down the road a long time ago, so I'd like to thank Tom for that. And I'd also like to thank the hardware people at Intel, SolarFlare, Mellanox, et cetera, for giving valuable feedback as the discussions, these discussions happen on the mailing list over time. So thanks to you guys as well. Okay, so I'll take some questions if we have time for that. So for transmit checksumming, um, how do you differentiate uh, TCP versus UDP and the zero versus 65535 checksum? Oh, what are you talking about specifically? Uh, specifically that you need to know whether you're supposed to be filling in a TCP checksum or a UDP checksum. That's handled with the pseudo, pseudo header. So you're expecting the driver to parse the header. The software precedes the checksum field with whatever stuff you got to do. You're talking about for the transmit side? Yeah, I'm talking about the transmit side. If, if the hardware calculates a checksum of zero, if it's TCP, it has to write a zero. But if it's UDP, it has to write... write all ones for either case, TCP or UDP. And right. that's valid? Yep. Yep, it works. Because it's We've been, this has been done for, dec for more than a decade. This works. Yeah, it, it's valid because there's non-zero bytes somewhere in the headers. You're guaranteed to have, you know, it's not valid to send from zero to zero. So the fact that you're stuffing some bits in the pseudo header guarantees that you're going to end up with a, a the value's going to reset itself because as soon as you add anything to either zero or all Fs, it becomes that value. So, so basically what we're saying is we never send a TCP checksum of zero. Because for a once complement checksum, zero or all ones is the same thing. There, it's equivalent. Yep. So, so for checksumming, I think your requirement is clear. But there's so the next chapter is GRO and LSO, right? So GRO is in software, it's okay. And what people um, talk to how how did how did how the designers? So they're asking. What's your actual requirement for the LSO? You want to do LSO on anything, right? So you have this slide with the TX, so what, can you state the requirement? I haven't, I haven't thought very deeply about uh, segmentation offload in that regard. I know that our software stack is capable of doing all the LSO stuff, uh, et, et cetera. Um, yes, but there is noticeable gain if you do that in hardware, right? So I understand, I understand. So we'll be... We'll have to come up with something. Okay, good. For sure, there's, there's no doubt about it. I understand that GSO, uh, the segmentation offloads are strictly tied to the checksumming facility. Yes, right, because if... Yes. So, I, if I can actually comment on that. So L, LSO in its nature is already TCP specific. And what we want there is the ability to make a generic, basically a generic TSO where the encapsulation can be present or not. And as long as we know the outer IP header, the inner IP header, the TCP header, and optionally where a UDP encapsulation header is, that actually encompasses like 90, probably 99% of the use cases for encapsulation and TSO. We have a reasonably generic solution, protocol generic solution for LSO. LRO is a whole different ballgame. Um, that's really hard to generalize, and we probably need to get into the uh, NIC programmability in order to really generalize that one. Uh, hey Dave, uh, so I'm Anjali and I guess um, I sent the Geneve patches where all this uh, kind of stuff got started, discussion. Um, so first I want to uh, mention that we took that feedback um, uh, to the hardware design folks that we want a generic checksum um, and we used to have that in IGB. It went away and we started doing more layered checksums and I guess uh, uh, this is a better approach. So that feedback has been given back. Uh, I want to talk something more. Um, so there is uh, the uh, Geneve patches that I sent out which helps ident identify a UDP tunnel for Geneve. Uh, the idea behind that was not just checksum, it was flow steering as well. So uh, identifying a UDP port, uh, protocol, a tunnel protocol using a port number, uh, the hardware is designed in such a way that I can have multiple different UDP 
uh, tunnel protocols, uh, um, you know, that I can um, uh, very flexibly program um, on the fly and then use the inner header information to steer the packet. And the only way uh, the hardware can do that is if it knows what port number is matched, mapped to what protocol. So, um, so we, we still have that kind of um, uh, input we need from the stack into the driver so that hardware is aware of which tunnel. So a point I want to make is you can do all these fancy VXLAN offloads, UDP, GRE tunnels, all this stuff. I don't care. Right. That's fine. Whatever other silicon's there, whether we use it or not, I don't care. As long as you give the stack the, the way to get that, that one's complement 16-bit value, everything else is fine with me. Right. That, that makes sense. So I think these are, these are separate issues. Right. They're right. completely separate issues. I don't think there's, a, there's an in, implicit conflict in any way between these two <laughs> right. facilities. Yeah, uh, then elaborating on that point, having a separate hook for each tunnel to... Yes, we have a proliferation of hooks right now and it's getting out of control. I totally, yes, I so totally agree with you. Yeah. So this consolidation is absolutely necessary. Some better device driver abstraction is necessary. Right. Uh, I just want to uh, emphasize again on the TX checksum for in, uh, Intel NICs. That is still, uh, you know, generalized. So we have the same method where we just say, put the checksum here and you know, do it over this length kind of thing. So that still is okay. It's um, the receive side, which we, uh, you know, we don't provide a checksum in the descriptor up above, which needs to be fixed. Um, one last comment on the switch dev stuff. So we will we'll definitely be backing this up uh, because we have a lot of use cases as well coming up. So my next uh, keynote, I can say thanks to Mellanox and these guys, we have two. So please, the next vendor, upstream your switch strip driver. <laughs> but that's good news. Thanks for letting me know. So, so David, back to the Dave and Tom. So, so maybe it's not that you, that the hardware will support a fixed, you know, GRE or VXLAN. It just will give you a knob to program us, right? So, so for LSO, we, we would need to know that it's, let's say, it's UDP port 500, which accounts to this size of header which you would use as a template to stick it into packet. That's it. So, so it's really, uh, it will be a general purpose programming knob. Not, not a, uh, you see what I mean? I can see how it works on transmit. I'm not so sure how it works. transmit? Yes. I totally understand how it could be generalized because it's just templating and replication. And what are the parameters for that replication? Good. Yep. We're all good? Thank you very much.